boys and girls. I want us to begin this morning by singing a chorus, a couple of choruses that you're very familiar with. The first one is about how big our God is. My God is so big. You know this. So I'm not going to hold up the words because I want you to do the motions with me. You ready? My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the rivers are his, the stars are his, and he worked too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do for you. And our other little chorus I wanted us to sing is, We have a mighty God who can do anything. Sing that with me. We have a mighty God who can do anything. He can calm a storm or hear a small bird sing. Our mighty God sees me and everything. What a mighty Mighty God, we do have a mighty God who can do anything and who has loved us and promised to always be with us. Remember our key verse for this whole last few lessons, we've had a good many lessons. God promised his people. It tells us right here in God's true word. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 15, I'm going to read it to you. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. God has promised to watch over his people wherever we go. And his people are any of us who believe in him and who ask him to come into our life and be our savior. And he's promised to be there with us all the time. And the next hymn you're not familiar with, I don't think, because it's a very old hymn and we've never sung it. But I wanted us to learn it. Just when I need him most. Jesus is always with us, boys and girls, always with us. But if we notice it even more just when we need him most, just when things aren't always going right. But he's with us in the good times and the bad times. Listen to me sing this through one time, and you look at follow with the words, and then I want you to sing it with me. You ready? Just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear, ready to help me, ready to cheer, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, just when I need him most, Jesus is near to comfort and cheer, just when I need him most. And we're going to see in our story today how God was right there with a young boy named Joseph as he went through many, many hard times. And he's with, Jesus is with you and with me. From the time we ask him to come into our heart, he lives inside of us and goes everywhere with us and is with us always. So sing this with me. Try it with me. And we'll sing it again another week. Just when I need him, Jesus is near. Just when I falter, just when I fear. Ready to help me, ready to cheer. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most. Just when I need him most. Jesus is near to comfort and cheer. Just when I need him most. Good singing. I appreciate you trying that. And we'll sing it another week too. Because that's a wonderful hymn to remember. That Jesus is with us all the time. Helping us through every, every time when we need him. But he's also there in the happy times. To celebrate and have joy with us as well. Well, our lesson today, we move on in Genesis. We're still in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, and we're going to be in chapters 37 for 36 of those verses in chapter 39, all the way through some chap verses in chapter 41. Um, and before we begin, though, 
let's ask God. This story is going to be familiar with him, familiar with to you, but I want you to ask God to show you what he wants to teach you from this story today. So let's pray. Dear God, thank you for your true word, the Bible. Thank you that you have a new message for us every time we read your word. So help us to be good listeners to what you want to teach us today. Well, he's going to teach us many things, but our big question today is, who is always with us? And I've already answered that when I gave you that verse in Genesis 28, 15. God is always with us. Even when things happen that we don't understand why they are happening, God is there with us to protect us and guide us, just like our hymn said. Well, Jacob had settled. Now, you remember, we left Jacob and Esau last week. They had just made up. Jacob had come back, and his brother Esau was no longer angry with him. And Jacob was apologizing and asking his for Esau's forgiveness and he, because God had changed Jacob. God had spoken to Jacob. And that, you remember when he wrestled with him um, as he slept that night, we said that God would speak to people in dreams, but he was physically wrestling with God, we're told in his word, and that um, he told God he wasn't going to leave him till quit wrestling until he blessed him, and God blessed him and gave him a new name. His new name would be Israel. And he, we learned that he gives us a new name too. When we ask Jesus to come into our heart, we become children of God, or we call ourselves Christian after Jesus Christ, Christian. And so we get a new name as well. Well, in our lesson today, Jacob, you know, had been away many years. And when he came back, you remember I told you he had a big family and how he arranged them as he was coming back to meet Esau and he had a lot of cattle. And at the very end of our story, it said he settled in the land that God had promised him. Well, he had settled in Canaan. And this was the land that he had promised to actually Jacob's grandfather, Abraham. It, it would always be his land and his family's. Well, Jacob had 12 sons by now. And Joseph was his favorite. And unfortunately, um, Joseph, uh, Jacob didn't make any secret about it. He let everybody know it. He, he had a special robe of many beautiful colors made for, for Joseph and gave it to him. And he just did all kind of special things for Joseph. And it made Joseph's brothers very angry. Well, something else made them angry angry because they were very jealous of Joseph because of the way his father treated him. One day, Joseph came to his brothers and he said, I had a dream last night. Now, Joseph was being a little bit acting like he thought he was better than them because remember, God would speak to people in dreams. And this dream we will find in the scripture will come true, but it'll be a part of God's plan for a good thing to happen to Jacob's family. And we'll learn about that in a few weeks. But in the story today, it is not such a good idea for Joseph to share this um, dream with his brothers. But he does. And he says, I dreamed that we were all gathering grain and fixing it up in bundles. That's how they would store the grain. And he said, all of a sudden, my bundle stood up straight, but 11 other bundles. And the, the brothers knew this meant their 11 bundles bowed down to me. In other words, he said, I was in charge over all of you. And then he said, another night I had a dream where the sun and the moon and 11 stars bowed down to me. Well, this upset Father Jacob, too. And he got after Joseph for sharing this dream because the sun and the moon would have represented his father and mother. And the 11 stars would have represented the brothers. And Jacob knew that this was not good for Joseph to be sharing this. Well, Joseph, many, many things happened like this to make Joseph's brothers um, not like him at all. And so one day, they would have to go and tend the sheep, but Joseph was younger, and so he stayed at home. And one day, um, 
um, his father, Jacob, said, Joseph, I want you to go check on your brothers and see how they're doing as they tend the sheep. And so it was a good ways away, but Joseph walked and we started getting a little closer to the brothers. They looked up and they saw him coming and they said, hmm, now's our chance. We can get back at our brothers. We will kill him. We are tired of him acting like he's better than us. And so they made up a plan that they would um, kill him when he got there. Well, Reuben, the oldest brother, said, no, let's not kill him. He said, let's throw him in that pit over there and just leave him. But Reuben was planning to come back and save his brother. So that's what the brothers did. First, they threw him in the pit. First, they took his coat off, and then they threw him in the pit. But while they were eating, they were sitting on the side of the road eating, and here's Joseph in the pit. A band, they called them a band, when a group of people would travel, they were like traveling salesmen. They had special things that were grown in their country, and they were taking them. They were the Ishmaelites they lived, and they were going to Egypt to sell all of these things. And so the brother said, oh, I know, we won't have his blood on our our conscience. We won't feel bad about killing him. We'll just sell him to these men and let him be their servant. And so that's what they did. They sold him to these band, band of Ishmaelites. And as um, Joseph um, <clears throat> traveled with them when they got to Egypt, they sold him to Potiphar, who was in charge over everything of the kings. He was a very important officer in the Egyptian army. And so while he was working for Potiphar, Potiphar saw how God was blessing Joseph. Everything he seemed to do went right. He took care of the whole household of um, Potiphar and all the, all the things that had to be done that were Potiphar's job. And so Potiphar made him in charge over everything. But unfortunately, another bad thing was going to happen that was not fair to Joseph. But remember what I verse said, that God had promised, I will go with you. He had promised, I will never leave you. And so, sure enough, God was with him because Potiphar told a lie. to Potiphar's wife told a lie to Potiphar. She said, told, that said Joseph did something very bad that he did not do. And so Potiphar believed her and threw Joseph in prison. But God was with Joseph. And remember, God had given Joseph the ability to interpret, to tell what dreams meant. Way back, you know, he had told about these other dreams. And we're going to find out later in our scripture that they come true. But right now in the story, the cupbearers, um, the, the king's cupbearer, he was the person that would taste everything um, before the king would drink it to be sure it was okay, that nothing was wrong with it. But he had done something that had made the king angry, so he'd been put in prison. And the baker had been put in prison as well. And they had had a strange dream. And they came and told their dreams to Joseph. And Joseph in interpreted them. He said, well, your dream tells me that the cupbearer is going to be accepted by the king again. and He's going to get to work for the king again, but the baker will not. And sure enough, that happened. And as the cupbearer was going to work for the king, Joseph reminded him, remember, I was able to interpret your dream. Tell, tell the king I was put here uh, it wrongly, that I should not be in jail and what I've been doing in the jail. And the cupbearer promised that he would. But when the cupbearer started working for the king again, he forgot all about Joseph. For two years, he never thought again about Joseph. And Joseph remember, remained in prison, working in the prison. Well, one night, the king had a dream. He could not interpret what that dream meant. He didn't interpret means he didn't know what it meant. And he called all his wise helpers to come and tell him. Nobody could tell him what it meant. And all of a sudden, the cupbearer remembered. He remembered Joseph. He said, there's a young man 
in the prison that can interpret dreams. He told me exactly what would happen to me, and it did. The king said, well, send for him. Send for him right away. And so they sent for Joseph, got him all dressed up to go to the king. And when he heard the king's dream, he said, this is what it meant. In all of Egypt, there are going to be seven years of, of good rain and sunshine and lots of crops are going to grow and we'll have lots to eat. But then there's going to come a famine. That's where there's no water. And when the famine comes, then there won't be anything to eat. And he said, uh, so what the dream means is that you should collect some of the food when there's more than people need now in these seven years. You should collect some of it, put somebody in charge and have them save it so that when the seven years come, when we have the famine, we'll have something to eat. Well, the king says, Joseph, you've done such a good job of taking care of everything in the prison. And when you work for Potiphar, I'm going to put you in charge. And he did. He put Joseph in charge of everything. Well, Joseph told Pharaoh that um, <clears throat> he could, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Joseph, Pharaoh made Joseph second in command over him. Pharaoh was still the king, but then Joseph was the next, and everybody had to do what Joseph said. And so Joseph came up with a great plan to save this food. Boys and girls, all of this, and we're going to hear some more about how God, this plan, is going to save the people in a, some of our lessons in the next few weeks. But God had, set, had been with Joseph. Did you see how he was with him when the brothers uh, sold him to the Ishmaelites and how he ended up in Egypt and how God took care of him when he was in charge of Potiphar's uh, household and then even in the prison how he worked and then how he was chosen to be over the whole country. Well, God used Joseph in Egypt and blessed him so that he was in a great uh, uh, place of honor, a great position. He was God's instrument in saving his family and many other people when that famine came along. Well, you know what, boys and girls? We have someone who has done a much, much greater job and that is Jesus. God sent Jesus. It was part of his plan to save you and me, not from starvation, but for something far worse. God was going to save us from our sins. So he sent Jesus, the only perfect person, to be the sacrifice to die on the cross for you and for me. You see, boys and girls, God has promised that he would be with his people. And his people are those people who believe in him. And just as he was with Joseph and all the, um, the people of Israel that followed him, so he is with you and me today in everything that we do once we ask him into our heart. He guides us and directs us every step of the way. And the way he does that is the Holy Spirit comes to live in our heart. And as we pray and talk to God and ask him to lead us and guide us and direct us, he does that day by day. And so God, just as God um, worked a plan to save the people um, from hunger at that time, he had even a greater plan for us, and that was to save us from our sins. I ask you, have you asked Jesus into your heart? Have you asked him to come and live inside of you and guide and direct you every day? If you haven't, today's the day to do that. Talk to mom and dad. Talk to Pastor Ron and see what your next step is. We're going to have more and more stories about how God's plan, all about God's plan for us. But I think this is the great way for us to begin seeing how God is with us every step of the way. And that's why I wanted us to see that he's with us just when we need him most, all the time. Because we need him most all the time. 
So let's have our part four in praise and praise him for protecting us, for providing for us, just like he did for the people of Israel back all those many years ago. He provides for you and for me today. And the greatest thing he provided was a savior to save us from our sins. So let's praise him and thank him. Dear God, I praise you that you are a sovereign God in control of all. You are our savior. You made a way for us to be saved from our sins. You are our redeemer. We were yours to begin with. You created us, but you had to buy us back from sin, so you redeemed us. You love, you loved us so much, you gave your life for us. You are almighty God. You are trustworthy. You always do what you say you will. You are faithful. You have promised to go with us wherever we go. We could go on praising you forever, but now we want to thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, to die on Calvary's tree, from sin to set me free. Someday he's coming back, what glory that will be. Wonderful his love to me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation, so rich and free. Amen. Well, boys and girls, don't forget what I said. Today's the day to give your life to Jesus if you have not already done it. And if you have already given your life to Jesus, every day is the day to thank him. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. And I want just to sing that little chorus, and that's going to be our closing benediction today. You ready? Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus I love him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and he's the one I'm living for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Enjoy those sweet days with Jesus. I love you, and God loves you even more.